Welcome everyone. Good evening. My name is Anna-Marijn Upker and I am a program editor here at the Bali. This evening we are delighted to welcome one of the most influential and creative economists of our time, Professor Mariana Mazzucato. And I'm also really happy that you are here tonight with us, the people here in the Bali, and also the people who are watching the live stream online. Mariana Mazzucato is a professor of economics at the University College in London, and she is the director of the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. She is the author of two highly acclaimed books, The Entrepreneurial State and The Value of Everything. She advises policymakers all around the world on issues such as inclusive and sustainable growth, and her work is of particularly importance now we are finding ourselves in the midst of one of the biggest crises in our history, the corona crisis. In a recent op-ed in The Guardian, Professor Matsukato um, uh, uh, Grown that the COVID-19 crisis provides actually a unique chance for capitalism to do things differently. So tonight we will speak with her on the biggest problems of the current economic system and we will look at possible solutions. Matsukato advocates for a proactive state and I'm also really curious to hear how far this state intervention should go. Then, finally, about the setup of this evening, we will first listen to a keynote by Mariana Matsukato, and after her keynote, I will ask her some questions. But after this, there is a lot of time for you, for the people here in the Bali, uh, to ask some questions to Professor Matsukato. So I would like to encourage you as well uh, already to start thinking about what you would like to ask her, and I will get back to you later on during this evening. But first, um, we will listen to Mariana Matsukato. A really warm welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? It's all good? <laughs> um, so I guess my, my big message, and I want to keep this short because I think it'll be, especially in this setup, what's nice is the discussion, is to really warn against any desire to go back to normal. And, you know, it's hard not to resist going back to normal. I have four children. They're all in the house. I would love to kick them out to make them go back to normal so they would be back in school, but also being able to do the you know, fun things that kids do over the summer. Um, the problem is that normality in terms of how we've actually structured our modern capitalist system is what actually got us this crisis. It's also what got us the financial crisis that was not long ago. And it's also what got us the climate crisis. So in some ways, we're living right now through these multiple crises, an economic crisis. And by that, I really mean that so many countries around the world have still not recovered, not just the rate of growth since the financial crisis from 2007, 2008, but a real kind of redirection of the kind of growth that we need to have growth that doesn't kind of bring us from crisis to crisis. And, and I'll speak a bit about that in a second. But also the climate crisis, we should remember that in, just in January and February, you know, just months ago, we weren't clapping health workers. We were clapping, at least you know, in a metaphorical way, the firefighters in California. Remember those big fires? The firefighters also in Australia, or the part of Italy where I'm from, the Veneto region, there was huge floods in Venice that you might remember. And these are all just kind of symptoms of global warming, which, you know, as Greta Thornburg tells us, just listen to the scientists. It's not, you know, we don't actually have to do much research on this. We know what the problem is. We know what the solution is. Let's get our act together. And then COVID occurred. Um, so this health pandemic, this massive health pandemic, which in some ways is at least in my lifetime, and I'm 52, definitely the biggest change in, in my lifestyle and kind of a real awakening of, you know, what does normality look like? And do we actually want to go back to that? Or is this a real opportunity to get serious about restructuring capitalism uh, to get us the kind of results we need to live a prosperous life and inclusive uh, growth uh, economy, sustainable growth, and you know, this is a period where governments are putting so much into the system, literally you know, billions or trillions globally into the system to get us out of this crisis that if we don't take advantage 
and structure those remedies in a proper way, we're just going to kind of put patches, band-aids on the system just to kind of set up the next problem. So really what I want to talk to you about in the next 10 minutes is what might it look like to really take advantage, to not let this crisis go to waste in terms of redesigning some fundamental principles of our economy. And especially, this is what I'll focus on, not so much the state, but public private partnerships to be much more purpose driven, to have a common purpose. I'm actually working with the Vatican right now. I'm not religious, but I'm working with the Vatican on the concept of the common good. So what is the common good lens on this crisis in terms of how public, private, and third sector come together to uh, restructure things? So first, I want to just remind ourselves what the problem is, just in case anyone is, uh, is you know, not focused enough. This was a, a bit of a lecture in the beginning, and then I promise I'll get a bit more lighthearted. Hmm. When I say that normality is not good and we shouldn't go back to normal, what I mean is that we have serious dysfunctionalities in how almost every actor in our system is currently working. I'll say this very kind of superficially and quickly, but just to go down my list, in terms of the financial sector, we basically have financialized finance. In other words, most of global finance today goes back to the financial sector. So think of it as a broadly defined financial sector, finance, insurance, and real estate. The acronym is FIRE, F-I-R-E. It's quite convenient that it sounds like, oh, the house is on fire. Um, and so we need to rethink, how do we restructure finance to go back into the real economy, but also what will it finance in the real economy? How can we, again, make sure that finance is being thrown at the most important problems of our time, which have to do with, the, again, the climate issue, uh, health, but also, as I'll speak about in a minute, the digital divide, which I think is more and more uh, relevant today, especially because so many children globally, not just in Europe, are at home, not being educated, and in those parts of the world where there's very difficult access to the internet, you have a huge number of, of kids just simply not being educated because of the digital divide. So how do we restructure finance, not just to be thrown back into real estate, but into you know, big global problems? Second, we know that there's a huge problem in how corporate governance is structured globally. Again, this is sort of a generalization, but it's a big trend. We have increasingly short-term, kind of quarterly return-focused business. Um, and in that sense, business itself has become financialized. In other words, focused more and more on just kind of boosting stock prices with activities like share buybacks, which just in the last 10 years has reached over 10 uh, um, uh, trillion, uh, sorry, $3 trillion have been spent just on share buybacks globally, which is huge. In many cases, like in the pharmaceutical sector, the energy sector, and the IT sector, you have some companies spending more on dividend payouts and share buybacks than on what they spend on some key activities in their area, like research and development. In some sectors, it's even more than their total net income. So they're actually dipping into capital reserves in order just to buy back shares, which boost stock prices, stock options, and executive pay. And this, you know, it's been talked about, but it hasn't changed very much. Third, we have huge inequality. In many countries, wages have stagnated, have fallen behind productivity. And this is why, actually, we also have a financialized economy. In many countries, workers have had to take out debt, loans, in order just to stay in place, to retain their living standards, because real wages haven't been increasing. And so there's actually a link between financialization and inequality. Fourth, we have a state structure in many countries, which, you know, in terms of the public sector, which doesn't really have much capacity. And I'm not thinking of money. In some countries also, maybe the state doesn't have money. But even when the state does have, you know, like in Europe and in, in, in Holland and in Italy and the UK, it's not that the state doesn't have funds. But unfortunately, in many countries, the state has been hollowed out in terms of capacity and really dynamic capabilities. It's not the best place to work. If you're a top graduate from a top university, you don't think, I'm going to become a civil servant. That's the best area uh, to be in. Because we've managed to convince ourselves this lie that the role of the public sector 
is just to fix market failures. You actually have to wait for something to go wrong before the state comes in. And so this notion of kind of patching things up, fixing market failures, has also determined the kinds of capabilities and knowledge that we think the state needs. And the answer is not much. If you're just fixing markets, if you're just enabling and pushing paper around, administering, regulating, again, fixing market failures, or de-risking the really cool risk takers in business, you don't really need that much knowledge. Uh, you know, you basically just need a good kind of administration, but you don't need the dynamic capabilities that uh, top managers go to study in business schools. Just think of, the, uh, think of the courses that are taught in business schools. They have these really sexy titles like uh, strategic management, decision sciences, organizational behavior. And they warn you in business schools, they say, be careful, because if your company becomes too big, too inertial, you know, kind of like a dinosaur, it's, it's going to fail. So there's these wonderful textbooks called like rejuvenating the mature corporation, which is all about how companies have to resist becoming too bureaucratic, too slow, not flexible. And we don't have that same kind of attitude in the state. So the word bureaucracy is a bad word. There's no reason bureaucracy should be a bad word. The question is, do we have good bureaucracies? Are they dynamic, flexible, creative, risk-taking bureaucracies? Or are they really boring, linear, static, and hollowed out bureaucracies? And I think we have the latter. And the last problem, how many have I named here? One, two, three, four. The fifth problem in terms of why normal is not good is what I've already mentioned, climate change. We've managed <laughs> to really put the, the, the health of, of people and planet at massive risk. The 2019 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is called IPCC, uh, they argue that we just have 10 years left until climate breakdown is completely irreversible. This is again why Greta went to Davos and, and also the European Parliament and uh, told off our leaders. But also just in 2019, last year, um, uh, subsidies to fossil fuel companies were estimated still at $20 billion a year in the United States and an enormous $55 billion a year in Europe. So we're actually not really moving, definitely not quickly enough, but there's still many structures that just simply haven't changed. Anyway, so that's my big warning. This is why we should do everything we can to resist going back to normal. Normal sucks. <laughs> normal is not good, okay? So then the question is, what do we do? Because we're also living through a massive you know, health pandemic. It's put our health services on their knees. Yes, some countries are getting over it, but there's likely going to be a second wave. You know, how do we make sure we just pause and kind of do a reset? And I don't have a huge amount of time to go through everything we want to do, but I just want to spend my last five minutes on kind of, you know, some big highlights of things that have to be, you know, bang on in front of us. Otherwise, we're going to really screw this up. And the first is to remember that money alone does not work. So already in the financial crisis back in 2009, plenty was thrown into the system, basically saved the capitalist system from falling apart. But a lot of that money, as I've already mentioned, also ended up either just back in the financial sector or it wasn't accompanied by really ambitious kind of real world investments in the new structures that we actually need to make our economies more resilient. And the most obvious area that we need globally, forget, you know, forget it if you're living in a, in, a, in a great neighborhood where you have great health services, most of the world doesn't. And we definitely need to make sure in terms of one big lesson is that these remedies, these trillions if you look globally, of dollars being put into the system, strengthen global health systems. If we don't do that, we are stupid. <laughs> because this pandemic has shown us that we are only as healthy as our neighbor is, literally on our street, in our workplace, in our city, in our nation, but globally. Had this epidemic begun in um, some of the African countries, which still have extremely weak health systems compared to China, we would all globally be worse off. So that's like a, you know, an obvious massive point. But the other point is around directing this finance is we should learn from actually you know, something that I've been arguing now for some years, that we need to make sure that funds go towards problems, problem solving. 
it doesn't make sense to focus on, you know, sectors that need help or types of firms, companies, you know, little SMEs, or, you know, just betting on technology or even on just one type of medicine. We have to start learning that policy is most productive and effective when it's focused on solving problems. You know, we got a man on the moon and back again 50 years ago because the problem that really focused minds, it focused all of Kennedy's administration was to beat the Russians. <laughs> they wanted to beat the Russians in space and they managed to pull together 400,000 people across the economy, huge amounts of money, a lot of innovation. The whole software industry came from that you know, man on moon mission, but it was a very targeted problem. It was getting a man to the moon and back again in one generation. And what I've been working on in the last years with the European Commission and many countries is to say, think of a mission-oriented, a moonshot-oriented uh, role of public policy. So today, think of all the problems we have around climate, around health, around the digital divide, which I've mentioned already. Turn those into moonshots and use all the money that's going into the system, not just to bail the system out, but really to kind of create new productive structures, but especially new collaborations between the state, between the private sector, the third sector, and civil society organizations to solve some of the biggest problems of our time. Because that means that these trillions going in also make the system much more resilient and help us get the kind of structures that even when crises come are gonna help us manage that crisis much better. And what's interesting is if you look globally, the countries that have best been able to deal with the crisis, even in the developing world, have actually been investing historically in the last kind of you know, 10 to 20 years in increasing their state capacity, but also in problem solving. And I'm thinking of countries like Vietnam. You should look into this. I've, I've written a bit about it, but just you know, Google Vietnam, COVID, you know, success and, and the management of the crisis. They have been quite extraordinary and, and they were um, you know, very responsive uh, in terms of really kind of getting together, um, you know, parts of academia, the business community and government to solve, you know, the problems both around the PPE, the personal protection equipment, but also in terms of spurring, you know, trust and by citizens who were, um, who actually believed what they were saying, unlike here in the UK where everyone hears these briefings and no one really believes that they have over time been trying to create more trust with citizenry, but also in Kerala, for example, where they've had a lot of investment over the last years, not only in health, but also in the different protocols that they had to put in place after their own virus outbreak, the Nipah virus outbreak. They really succeeded over time to form new types of interesting public-private partnerships, which again were bolstered by a, a citizen trust. But even in, again, going back to Vietnam, what was quite extraordinary is that when they were able to really quickly spur the development of low-cost test kits, which many countries haven't been able to do, they actually ended up even being able to export many of that you know, uh, testing and PPE equipment, which they uh, were able to produce through these public-private partnerships. But a lot of that had to do with their ability through the state to govern the crisis. And unfortunately, in many countries, we haven't seen that. In the UK, we have had to uh, outsource to the consulting companies like Deloitte our testing capacity. Um, and we haven't produced still enough personal protection equipment. Um, and, it, and it's very interesting, again, to really think through why that is. Where has the, you know, where has outsourcing kind of gone wrong in terms of too much outsourcing, literally, of state capacity? Um, but also, and I want to kind of finish on, on this next point, otherwise I realize I'm going over time already. It's very interesting to see how some countries have been willing to really you know, galvanize a different type of partnership, what I would call a more symbiotic, mutualistic partnership between uh, public and private. Because you know, the state alone cannot do everything, business alone cannot do everything. And I was quite struck by uh, Macron, Macron, the um, head of France, who said, you know, we're not there to save industry, to just bail them out, we're there to transform them. And so the kind of bailouts that both Renault, the car manufacturer, got, but also Air France, in France, uh, were conditional on those industries reducing their carbon emissions. Um, and, and it was very clear, you will not get bailed out unless you do so. Or in Denmark, uh, the country, the leaders, the, um, the government 
said, we're not going to bail out companies that use too much tax havens, or at least that don't commit to not using tax havens. And this is a big issue, by the way, in, in the Netherlands, where you are yourselves one of the, the manufacturers of these tax havens. So it's a huge problem globally. Um, but also in the US, for example, Elizabeth Warren uh, argued that we shouldn't be giving um, you know, bailouts to companies that have proven that they're more interested in just focusing on their share price. So this excessive use of share buybacks. There's, so there's conditions that are being negotiated now on the Senate floor that the bailouts be targeting companies that promise to invest in workers, in their own human capital and training formation, reducing carbon emissions, but also limiting limiting dividend payouts and share buybacks in this period. So don't ask the state for a bailout if you're just giving money away to your shareholders. And lastly, you know, everyone is talking about the vaccine. Uh, all the newspapers today, yesterday are talking about when will it come out? When is it happening? But we need to be careful. If we don't govern the innovation around vaccines or the drugs, like the remdesivir drug that Gilead is putting out, in a way that really is structured around this concept of the common good and public interest that I was talking about before, it's gonna fail. And this is why the World Health Organization has been insisting that we have, unfortunately, they talk about a voluntary, I would say a mandatory, uh, a ma so they talk about a voluntary patent pool. In other words, that the intellectual property rights, the patents, be pooled between the companies and the public organizations that are racing for this vaccine in order to really foster collective intelligence and not just rent seeking and barriers. And this is also because patents are often abused in the health space. They are often too wide, so used for strategic reasons. They are often too strong, so they prevent licensing. They are often too upstream, so the research is privatized. The tools for research are patented, which is crazy. So we need to govern the patent system if we're gonna make sure that a vaccine is available to everyone globally and universally accessible instead of being uh, impeded by some of this uh, way that patents are being abused. But also Gilead, this drug that's being put out called remdesivir, it was actually developed with huge amounts of taxpayer money, uh, over 70 million by the US taxpayer, and yet they're charging $3,120 for a dosage, <laughs> which is crazy, right? So how do we make sure we govern our systems in such a way that they really are focused on the common good and public good. And it's not about charity. It's not about corporate social responsibility. It's about making sure that the deal, the relationship, the partnership, the ecosystem between public and private changes from being predator prey, from being parasitic to being symbiotic and mutualistic. And I'll close on that because I was in Davos this year as unfortunately many of us were and all the talk was on stakeholder, not shareholder capitalism and purpose, purpose-driven capitalism. And my main message is if we cannot figure out now how to be more purpose-driven and really make sure that all stakeholders benefit from the trillions being poured into the system, then let's stop bullshitting around stakeholder capitalism and purpose. We need to walk the talk. And if we can't walk it now, we're gonna have a problem. And I just really believe in details. We need to get our hands dirty sector by sector, whether it's the digital area for the digital divide, the Green New Deal, which has to be on the agenda to make sure we have conditionalities around it and governing health innovation in order for the kind of economy and society that we build to be more inclusive and sustainable. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, very brief and, uh, and, and clear story. Um, before we dig into many of the points um, uh, you have uh, just mentioned, I was wondering what your reaction is to this historic deal that was presented yesterday by the mm. European Commission on the recovery plan. Before we dig into many of the uh, interesting uh, subjects you just touched upon. So I think it's very encouraging, first of all, that a deal was struck and we didn't just get into massive infighting, which, as you know, we've seen in, in recent years between the member states. It's a very important deal. They should be congratulated. I'm a bit worried about some of the investments and promises actually around the Green Deal, which we've seen be reduced. And I think yeah. that's a tragedy and we need to keep pressure that it's not COVID or green. We need you know, a smarter, a greener, a more sustainable, a healthier, uh, economy and in that sense we need to keep you know those objectives what i like about it though is that it sort of takes away the tension from the 
this uh, ideology, if you want, that for many years has been plaguing Europe, which is that the southern countries, you know, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, which Goldman Sachs infamously called the pigs. <laughs> I'm from Italy, so I can say that. If a German calls <laughs> Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain a pig, that's terrible. So it was just an acronym, <laughs> terrible acronym. The ideology has been that those countries spend too much, that those countries have a, a public sector that's too big. And in order to get European you know, uh, money, uh, bailouts or whatever, they need to cut their deficit. And that's been tragic because the deficit was not the problem in any of those countries. Italy has had a lower deficit than Germany for many years. It's had a higher debt to GDP though, higher debt to GDP. Why? Because the denominator, GDP, was not being driven by one of its key drivers, which is productivity. So it, in Italy and many of these southern countries, productivity has not been growing. But why? Because they have not been investing enough public money, enough public money in research and development, in science industry linkages, in worker training, like vocational training, all things that, for example, Germany has been investing loads on. So what I hope is that this new era of, with the recovery fund and hopefully also with this mission orientation, which um, I wrote a report for, for the European Commission, it became a legal instrument. They voted on it, so now we have missions as an instrument. That the combination of these two things, so money and purpose, allow us to start asking the right questions and not the wrong questions in mm -hmm. Europe. It's not about how much money will you cut to get access to the recovery mm -hmm. fund. It's what will you spend on? What will you invest on? How will you make your economy more resilient? So would you also uh, say that um, uh, our Prime Minister Mark Rutte asked the wrong questions during Absolutely. I think it was a massive failure. And, you know, I've met him and, and I think he's a great guy, so I have nothing against him personally. I think he was a bit of a pain in the... <laughs> he was asking the wrong questions. The questions we need to be asking have to be very specific. It's, it's not that we don't want conditions. The conditions should be Will you invest in long run growth opportunities? Because if countries don't, the competitiveness between European countries will get wider and wider and wider. And that means you will always have some countries bailing out other countries. But the reason for that is not because their state is spending too much. If you look at the, mm -hmm. the size of government spending between these countries, it's almost the same. Um, it's because they have not been strategic. They haven't had enough private investment. In many of these countries, the private sector is also the problem. The state sector is the problem. And really thinking through what's the organizational capacity that we need, again, whether we need more patient long-term finance like the KFW provides in Germany, science industry linkages, vocational training, all these things we know, are, or education. You know, many, of the, many countries have not been spending enough on education, which we know is a, a driver of growth. So we need in Europe to get more sharing, more learning, what works, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. But we need to get granular. It cannot just be cut, 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 cut your deficit. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where I think, hopefully, the recovery plan will go. But we'll see. Mm -hmm. I mean, the devil's in the detail. Yeah. And you already spoke uh, about some of the biggest uh, uh, dysfunctions in the current system. And you uh, gave some examples. But if you have to choose, like, what is the biggest flaw, according to you? What would you, what would you say? Well, I wrote a book called The Value of Everything, where I argue the biggest flaw is that we've confused price with value. <laughs> it becomes this tautology. So I don't know in uh, Holland, in the Netherlands, what you have used as the word, but here we've called it essential workers yeah. or key workers, right? And that's, you know, when we were clapping on Thursdays, it was for the essential workers. So the real question is, how could it be that we have undervalued the essential workers for the last 50 years? And if you look at how we construct GDP, um, we only include, you know, so the measure of national output, we only include those activities that have a price. Mm -hmm. So if you marry your babysitter, GDP will go down. I'll let your audience, if they haven't drunk too much wine, figure it out. If, um, <laughs> do they have one? <laughs> if you pollute, GDP goes up, right? Because if you have to pay for someone to clean up the pollution, that increases GDP. If the babysitter who was working but getting paid now is mm -hmm. you know, married, whether it's to a woman or a man, doesn't matter, is still doing the same work but not getting paid, GDP goes down. 
what that means is we are not valuing many parts of the economy that, that we know matter, but either don't have a price or the value is simply not being captured. For example, public education and public health, the output doesn't go into GDP because we don't know how to value yeah. that because so, it's free. But so, the input does, right? So the cost of school teachers, yeah. the cost of nurses, the cost of doctors goes into GDP. But the actual value that's produced doesn't. So I think one of the biggest wake-up calls has to be we need to think of value differently, mm -hmm. not confuse price with value, which is one of the reasons the financial sector looks productive simply because it earns a lot, right? So if you confuse price yeah. with value, you confuse income with productivity, basically. Um, and I, I really think that has to be the biggest wake-up call because when I said we need to fund our health services better, that's not going to happen unless we know mm -hmm. how to value them. Yeah. So, uh, so I also hear in your story that actually this, this GDP isn't the right indicator anymore uh, in order to measure economic success. What should we, how can we practically do this? According to your theory. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm not the first person to say GDP doesn't work. There's no. plenty of you know, really good research there. One of the things I pointed to is that instead of just bringing things into GDP, like well-being and happiness, mm -hmm. we should first take things out. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's like my husband has a rule in my family. Every time I bring a piece of junk that I buy at an antique shop, two things have to go out. <laughs> Otherwise, our house gets very crowded. <laughs> Um, and so a lot of what we include in GDP today is actually rent. It's actually value extraction, but because we don't ask what kind of finance, you know, what are, you know, what are hedge funds actually doing? What is private equity actually doing? Is it creating value or is it extracting value? If it's simply earning a fee, we put it into GDP. So one of my points when we want to clean up GDP is I say first take out take out the wrong stuff mm -hmm. and ask yourself this distinction between rents and profits, value extraction, value creation. But the other thing is, if you were driving a car, you would want to have lots of information on your dashboard. If you only knew how much gas you had, or if you only knew how fast you were driving, or if you only knew, um, I, don't, I don't drive, so I can't even think of examples. I just ride my bicycle like you do in, <laughs> in Amsterdam. <laughs> Anyway, you need a dashboard. You need lots of different indicators to tell mm -hmm. you the health of your car, whether it needs a checkup, et cetera. The same thing with the economy. We must resist having one number. Mm -hmm. However, I, I will tell you that even with the wrong number, GDP, it could actually tell us a lot, which we don't even use it for. So it's really the question that's being asked. It, it, it's not just we need better metrics. Mm -hmm. We need to ask better questions. Mm -hmm. So in the UK, for example, and in the US, what should be in the newspapers is not. If you use GDP, you would be able to tell that the kind of growth we have in the UK has been consumption led. Mm -hmm. And that can, so, you know, GDP can be broken down into government investment, business investment, consumption, spending, and net export. So C plus I plus G plus X minus N. The C, consumption, is what's been driving GDP. That's been fueled by private debt, private debt, not public debt. So the ratio of private debt to disposable income in the UK is at record levels. It's at the same level it was in 2007. And that's what caused the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. So forget COVID now, because obviously we're focused on that. No one was talking about this in December and November in the UK election. It's not in the perception that mm -hmm. we are about to have another financial crisis. Now, again, we're worried about other things. That is what you can see from GDP. So, but even with this problematic measure, we can see something if we ask the right question. Mm -hmm. So we need to ask better questions. And I'm also, I'm always uh, quite shocked by the fact that we hear in the media all the time um, uh, that people say that um, uh, there will be a recession next year, so we will have less growth, economic growth. And I'm curious, like, is that really a problem if we don't have economic growth? What is, what, what is wrong with that actually? Well, it's a huge problem, and um, it's a huge problem, but the problem is if you just think about growth, that's also the problem. Yeah. So growth for growth's yeah. sake is a huge problem. That's what got us the financial crisis. There was no lack of growth in 1990s. Mm -hmm. The problem is the direction of growth, and mm -hmm. I have very little patience for those who say no growth. It means you don't care about unemployment. It mm -hmm. means you don't care about productivity. It means you basically don't care about the global working class, you know? Uh, to be really um, facetious, it's a bobo, la bourgeoisie bohème, 
can talk about no growth. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's correct to question the source of growth. If we have financialized growth or growth that is putting our planetary boundaries at risk, I know that Amsterdam has done a wonderful thing of inviting my very good friend Kate Freyworth to come and help around you know, the donut, the circular economy. That's a different type of growth. It's not the lack of growth. Mm -hmm. If you have a green economy, there's all sorts of new services you need, including maintaining products, right? We are so used, uh, used to the culture of usa e getta, we say in Italian. You use and you throw away. That's, you know, mm -hmm. that's bad. And that came from an era where we thought markets were limited, right? So because you only had a certain amount of middle class people buying dishwashers, you needed to make sure that the dishwasher broke, so you bought a new one. As we have an expanding middle class globally, um, especially but not only in China, you know, you do have the opportunity to completely rethink product obsolescence. That requires a whole new service sector to maintain existing products. I mean, that's just a, a little example, but it just means it's not about not doing more. It's just different what we're doing. Mm -hmm. It would still cause growth. And if you had a carbon neutral city strategy, you know, which had to do with all sorts of new ways that people get mobile around a city or a region or a nation, that can bring you a particular type of growth because it requires new types of investments and new mm -hmm. goods and services that are more sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what I mean by mission-oriented policy driven by the sustainable development goals. There's 17 goals. There's 169 targets beneath those goals. Mm -hmm. They can drive the kind of growth we have. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we've had in the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. We've had the opposite. We will be having uh, elections here next year in the Netherlands. And I am uh, really curious to hear your advice to politicians that are currently writing this summer uh, already about the, the election programs and the proposals they are going to make. What would your uh, first idea be to, uh, uh, what, what, what is the most important policy goal, according to you, which should be incorporated in their uh, programs? Mm. So I don't know much about Dutch politics, so I'll just say more generally. I think there's um, the kind of three points I mentioned I think are very important. First, we need a plan on, on the welfare state. Instead of thinking that's an old idea, let's be, make it the most creative, dynamic welfare state, how we structure public services, how we structure public procurement. Procurement means government as purchaser. You know, when governments buy things to make schools and hospitals, that budget is huge. In the UK, for example, we have uh, our whole innovation budget is 10 billion pounds, but just the procurement budget, so government purchasing things for the Department of Transport, one little part of government is 40 billion. So four times as much as our whole innovation budget. So if you change how government works in the everyday normal boring things and make it a driver of innovation, big idea. So we need the progressive parties of the world, mm -hmm. at least those who think they're progressive, to talk about let's rethink and make really dynamic and creative the welfare state, one. Two, make sure that public and private work together on solving the biggest problems of our time. Those are the sustainable development goals, but every country needs to interpret them in a way that makes most sense, right? It has to be context specific. So focus on an outcomes oriented, mission oriented, moonshot driven, uh, role of policy, but especially in how public and private interact. And I think, you know, the biggest problem I do think we have, because sometimes we forget it now, is global warming. The more we can have cities like Amsterdam and Copenhagen, Berlin and London, really rethinking how the citizen lives from when they wake up in the morning to when they go to bed at night and their whole experience during the day can become a target of kind of smarter, healthier, more sustainable living and to make sure that we have targets and metrics along the way to measure whether we've improved citizens' mm -hmm. lives, you know, from literally when they wake up to when they go to bed. And that's what, again, I mean by uh, outcomes-driven policy. If we don't have those targets and metrics, then unfortunately, we end up just talking. You know, we mm -hmm. talk about the big problems, but we don't have the metrics to tell us in terms of that dashboard that we were talking about before, if we're getting better or not. So I think any party that is able to actually explain how it will test itself after six months of being mm -hmm. in power, after 12 months of being in power mm -hmm. on whether we've made citizens' lives any better, and also remembering that class matters, race matters, ethnicity matters. We know there's deep structural 
not just racism, but classism in many countries. So that needs to be embedded in the metrics. It's not true we're all in it together. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we, you know, some have done much better than others during the lockdown. So that needs to be a cross-cutting theme. But still, we need better metrics to measure whether our policies are working. And it'd be great if the politicians who are running for an election give examples. How will they do that? How will they know if after six months they're failing? Mm -hmm. And they should say that already in the election campaign. Yeah, really interesting. Um, one of the things you mentioned already a few times is, is this idea of uh, uh, more public-private uh, partnerships. Mm. And in this you see uh, it shouldn't be the state alone, but the, the state plays a, an important role. But are there also dangers of giving the state more, uh, more influence in this? Do it depends. It, I mean, it depends what kind of state, but it also <laughs> depends what kind of business sector, right? So any organization in the economy, public, private, or third sector, can be structured or governed in different ways. So the reason I set up this institute in London called the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at UCL, which is a university, so we're actually a department, is because I really believe we need a new education system for bureaucrats. We need a new curriculum for civil servants globally. Um, we need to bring back these deep, deep concepts like public value, which the BBC, which is a public broadcaster, interestingly has within the BBC. They, they make decisions on whether to fund a soap opera, a documentary, particular news program on whether they think it will advance public value. You know, this is why they made EastEnders a, a soap opera about the working class instead of just Dallas and Dynasty about the rich and famous in, um, you know, the U.S. kind of uh, soap operas. Just, it's a stupid little example, but just to say they have within that public organization had a deep discussion of what is the state for, yeah? Unfortunately, those who argue for more state or less state, unless it's talking about what kind of state, what is the mm -hmm. public sector for, we end up getting the wrong mm -hmm. structures. And so my point often is, instead of thinking of the public sector as fixing a market failure, which is the, the, the way that economists mm -hmm. say it, we should think of it as shaping and creating markets alongside business, but to, to really you know, produce what we call public value and public interest. If, the role of the state is to make sure that its investments, even in the internet, which was state funded, GPS was state funded, Siri was state funded, touchscreen display was state funded, everything in your smartphone was state funded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wrote about that in my book, The Entrepreneurial State. Um, if we then don't govern digital platforms to make sure that, again, citizens benefit, then that's a screw up. The point of the state is not to increase profits. It's to, first of all, increase private investment, to crowd in private investment, but to mm -hmm. do so in such a way for public goals. Mm -hmm. So in Barcelona, for example, the city mayor, Ada Colau, she brought in some hackers, you know, uh, like computer hackers, mm -hmm. software hackers, and data hackers, digital hackers, to the city team to hack the system. So when data is created, when people click on city mapper and data is created, that data goes to kind of like a commons that the city created that's governed as a data commons, which then improves public transport. Currently, the way cities, or sorry, the public sector works is either it just doesn't invest and it's kind of rubbish, or when it does, it doesn't govern the process, whether it's the patents, the prices, the data, in such a way that citizens definitely benefit. So it just becomes part of the problem. It becomes part of the trajectory alongside business mm -hmm. and other problems, <laughs> finance that bring us into the wrong results. But I can imagine that you are in favor of some uh, public-private uh, corporations and less enthusiastic about some other public-private yeah. partnerships, uh, because I can imagine that, for example, the, the, the Dutch uh, investments in the weapon industry wouldn't be something that you would really um, uh, be in favor of, right? Yeah, I mean, look, I as an economist cannot go around lecturing people what to invest in. That would make no sense. I, my, my role has been to say the state has been much more transformational than we admit, both in the good and the bad. It's yeah. transformational, though. It's not there just kind of tinkering. Mm -hmm. So, again, everything in your iPhone, everything that makes it a smartphone was state funded. Most people don't know that. Most people don't know that Tesla would not exist without state funding. Um, but also fracking, shale gas was state funded. There's exactly. lots of controversy around that. 
Uh, the moon landing, which created things like software, was based on a Cold War ambition, right? It was kind of like a wartime beat the Russians. And, uh, so the first thing to ask is, given that the state, when it's structured ambitiously and mission-oriented, can transform things, what is the right mission, set yeah. of missions? Is it war? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. battling climate change, not battling you know, the Russians or the Chinese. But that requires a global effort. So there's a huge question about international cooperation because most of the problems we have, including you know, our oceans, which are full of plastic. I don't know if your audience has seen Blue Planet, wonderful documentary by um, Attenborough where the last episode shows all these you know, dolphins and sharks dying of, or fish because they're choking on plastic. To get the plastic out of the ocean, no city, no government can do it alone, no private sector company. It has to be a, a massive global mm -hmm. effort. So that's a global problem mm -hmm. that we can only do together, government, private sector, all the nations together. Are we going to do it? We need a structure. But also within countries, whether we talk about a carbon neutral city like Amsterdam, if, if it wants that, if we want to prevent knife crime in London, it's a huge problem now in the city where I live. We have very disadvantaged teenagers stabbing each other to death. That's not going to be solved by any one actor. Mm -hmm. You need lots of different sectors to come together to be much more aligned, to have a systemic view of the problem. Mm -hmm. And to then, from the government side, what I say is stop the handouts. Stop just giving out money. Make it conditional. So grants, mm -hmm. loans, procurement can become conditional so that you pick the willing companies in the private sector to engage with you to solve a problem. Going to the moon required not just NASA, there was General Electric, Honeywell, Motorola, uh, another company called Grumman, and many other companies that helped NASA get to the moon. But if you read the contracts, they were so ambitious. They were very short and dynamic, and they said, okay, this is what we need. We're not going to tell you how to do it. It's up to you, because if you micromanage, you kill innovation. Yeah, so but they actually, said, do that. We need that. So the internet helped the satellites communicate. You know, GPS helped to have much more specific navigation systems. But the question being asked was, we have a problem. Help us solve it. Yeah. In, in Holland, in, in the Netherlands, you have a problem. A lot of your policies, in the past at least, have not been like that. It's been indirect tax incentives. You have been one of the countries. Um, I used to talk to Minister Kemp. Uh, about this. And I think they, they sort of took it on board. I said, stop having all these tax incentives for innovation. That doesn't increase the investment spending on innovation. It just increases profits. You've made it cheaper to do something. Mm -hmm. But the additionality, this is the, the technical word we use in economics, additionality, which means a policy that makes things happen that would not have happened anyway, that is proven to be very low when you just reduce taxation. So all you do with reducing taxation is increase profits. Mm -hmm. You don't increase investment. Mm -hmm. So you need to redesign your policies to have more direct, ambitious investments, and then tax incentives as like icing on the cake, yeah. but not the cake. What I find also really interesting in your work is that you say that governments should actually start to look more like uh, companies and be more uh, creative and more active and more innovative in a way. Um, but one of the things that comes with that is that they should dare to take risks. Uh, and to learn by uh, trial and error. And I think this is yeah. really interesting because um, uh, we have, of course, politicians that are not so willing to take risks because uh, then people will not vote for them anymore during the next elections. So mm -hmm. how are we going to change this system um, uh, if we want to, be, to, to, if we want politics to become more um, uh, creative? Uh, it's, it's a very good point, and it is one that I keep banging on, but I would not say to be like the private sector, because the private sector in many countries is problematic, <laughs> as I mentioned in the beginning. It's about being creative and dynamic, and there's not enough creative and dynamic private companies. Many are inertial, they're happy with the status quo, but at least in theory, they're told to be dynamic and creative, whereas, and they're even told to take risks. So venture capital companies brag how risk-taking they are. Mm -hmm. And they will even brag about the failures because they know that you know, for every success, every successful investment a venture capitalist will have, there will be many failures along the way. And that's part of the you know, saying, yeah, it's okay, we failed, but then, bang, we had a big success. Whereas governments, when they fail, they're in the front page of the newspaper. Um, you know, oh, 
government, you know, stop picking winners, stop investing, just create background rules of the game and then get out of the way. And if that had been the attitude of many governments, again, we wouldn't have any of the technology in our phones uh, or smart products or even the green technology we have around us, all of which required massive risk taking by government institutions before the private sector came in. However, the main problem is that if you worry about the failure, you will increasingly outsource the, the, the thinking or the project management to the private sector. That is and what hap what's happening now, right? Yeah, huge amounts of, well, you know, literally globally trillions being given to consulting companies. You know, McKinsey, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Deloitte, KPMG. It's, it's not even their fault. They are getting more and more contracts. You know, Brexit is being run by the big four consulting companies. Brexit was done to save money. <laughs> and we all know that was a scam for all sorts of reasons. But even just the money that's being spent on the consulting companies to manage Brexit, because the government has defunded its own kind of brain uh, in civil service for, for such a long time, someone should find the number on that. It would be very interesting. But the main thing is that I believe that in order to tackle the big problems, we need both private and public together. They need new types of contracts, more symbiotic, less parasitic, but especially we need capacity and capabilities in both mm -hmm. in both the private sector and the public sector. Mm -hmm. And where private sector, we know that. That's why we have MBA programs in business schools around the world that are famous. Harvard Business School, Wharton, London Business School. I'm sure in, in, in Holland, you have great business schools. We don't have the equivalent ambitious, dynamic, creative thinking in the public sector. So in order to get these better relationships, we also need to reinvest inside our government institutions to be really dynamic, flexible, adaptive, but also knowledge and learning organizations willing to take risks, so, but also sharing the rewards. We can't just take the risks, we need to share in the rewards. Mm -hmm. So you would say that actually something should change uh, more in the political system than in the perception of people, because I can imagine that it's also uh, a case of perception. Yeah, I mean, it's not just a political system, it's literally just use the word public sector yeah. or public institutions, right? need to be stronger, more resilient, but that requires new education. I mean, if you look at the curriculum that's taught to civil servants, it's quite boring. It's actually taught them that government failure is even worse than market failure. So mm -hmm. if you do fix a problem, do it small, don't take up mm -hmm. too much space, but that, that lacks imagination, it lacks vision, it lacks design thinking, you know, a trendy word mm -hmm. nowadays, design thinking into the planning process. And I see some of the most interesting public programs happening at the city level, literally like, you know, whether it's Amsterdam, I already mentioned Copenhagen, Berlin, but also Medellin in Colombia, and increasingly some cities in Africa really kind of going after, for example, big problems around mobility and in, you know, getting more green or sustainable ways of um, moving around, not just transport, just living um, and cities are resisting in the, U in the United States and the states are resisting the federal government's kind of backwardness. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's very interesting. And I think we can take inspiration, mm -hmm. you know, in Denmark, for example, it's a tiny country. They've become the number one providers of high tech green services to China. And China is spending 1.7 trillion, trillion, that's 12 zeros in their, um, five-year plan towards greening the entire economy, and a little country, Denmark, is servicing it. So they, they don't only have manufacturing capacity through Vestas, you know, famous uh, uh, um, Danish uh, renewables company, but they've had to service through high-tech digital servicing uh, their own green transformation, which has often been region and city specific. Yeah. And in, in the process, they've developed real capacity to govern a green transition, which then, then they can export. So maybe we so should start on a more local level instead yeah. of on a national level. Absolutely. I mean, I think you need both. I think you really do need to set directions from the national, but allow as much local autonomy in the how. How do you do it? Otherwise, you stifle creativity if you micromanage. Really interesting. I'm going to uh, walk to the microphone because I am wondering whether there are some questions uh, from the audience. So take a moment to think about what you would like to ask, and then I'll get to you with the microphone. I see a question over there.
Hi, thank you very much. Um, I I'm really love that you uh, <clears throat> plead for a renaissance for the public, uh, for the public uh, state. Um, where does the power, the political power, come from? You see how it's in America, the lobbyists are extremely, extremely strong. In Europe, maybe a little bit less, but we are divided. Is, what do you think of China, which is basically more doing what you think a state should be doing? Is that maybe a model, or uh, does it have some disadvantages too? Great question. Um... So, first of all, anytime anyone asks me about any country, I, I almost resist it because I've been fascinated not by countries, but organizations within countries. Even though I'm quite negative, for example, on many things happening in the UK, there are some organizations in the UK, I mentioned the BBC, but also Government Digital Services, which is, I don't have time to talk to you about it, but it's quite inspirational what they've done in terms of putting the citizen at the center of how they designed a public website, gov.uk and thought of the citizen not as a customer or a client, but a, a user of kind of the welfare state and tried to make that experience much more empowering. Um, so I think what's interesting in China, first of all, what's not interesting is obviously that it's not democratic, that it has a very problematic human rights record, but it has made a commitment towards transforming its economy due to the urgent problem it has around pollution into a green direction. So 1.7 trillion, trillion, dollars worth that I mentioned before is interesting uh, because it, it's been there, you know, in some ways since at, at least five years, you know, before Greta, <laughs> um, at a time where a, a lot of European countries um, and Europe has been dragging its feet. Um, one of the issues in China I think that's interesting is a lot of the money is very centralized. So the China Development Bank, it's a public bank, I, you know, if you're interested in these issues, look into it. There's a good book called, uh, what is it called? The China Development Bank, Rethinking the Rules of Finance. That you see just how much money Huawei, but also lots of the green companies have received from this bank in order to get started. And that's both good and bad. It's good because we know that innovation is driven by patient, not impatient, patient, long-term finance. Venture capital is impatient. Venture capitalists want to want to exit. They want to exit through an IPO or a buyout. Whereas you know, public banks like the China Development Bank or the KFW in Germany or the European Investment Bank are all about patient long-term finance. And in theory, if they're structured properly towards a direction, right, a transformational direction that's important. And however, in places like Silicon Valley, there was lots of different public organizations that mattered. There was DARPA, there was SBIR, there was InQtel, there was the National Institutes of Health. I could kind of go on and on. So it was a decentralized network of public organizations across the whole innovation chain. In China, currently, we have big public organizations. And I think in the long term, it's not going to work. Forget the human rights thing for a minute. Again, I'm an economist. I, I know that's bad, but I, I, I don't have much to teach. We need to listen to others who have more experience on that. But just from the purely economic I think we need to worry for any country when they think that money, lots of money from big public or big private organizations can just be thrown at a problem. So the lesson from Silicon Valley is that there is a decentralized network of public state actors across the whole innovation chain that interacted with the private sector in a very dynamic way. That story is not told. We always pretend Silicon Valley was privately led. But it wasn't just about the state. It was a decentralized state. And so... In terms of an able, flexible, adaptable state, I think China has a model which will have to evolve to be more flexible, adaptable, and decentralized. And I'm not sure if that's happening. But I think it is easier as a government to make risky investments and to uh, be flexible and do what you mm. think is good if your politicians cannot be held accountable and you don't have to take into account Not flexible, but mission-oriented, yes. But then the question is, what is the mission? So in countries like China, you won't have debate about what the right mission is. But also in the U.S., to be honest, there's not much debate about it. But I think the ideal situation is where you have an active, mission-oriented, capable state <laughs> but lots of democratic engagement and debate about what's to be done, right? So this is why um, in some new work that I'm writing, I talk about citizen assemblies and different democratic fora 
to bring kind of that real stakeholder engagement, including, by the way, by trade unions. You know, there's a whole movement for the just transition, which I often argue is too late. You need workers and, and worker movements and worker voice to be at the table ex ante, not just ex post, not just afterwards to say, help, you know, don't leave us behind in a green transition. Yeah. We need all sorts of voices at the table to even define what is green. What is a sustainable city? Who's defining it? Is it just the elite and the experts? Yeah. Or do we really have inclusive All right. voices? Thank you so much. Another question. Can you briefly introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I can. Well, first of all, um, uh, Ms. Matsukato, thank you very much. For, uh, the way how you bring across this energy, even on the screen, uh, is, is surprisingly uh, good. Great, thanks. Uh, then introducing myself, I run a, a B Corporation for six years now. And now um, we produce sustainable facades to make the built environment more energy neutral. Um, and so, so I'm a big fan of stakeholder uh, optimization uh, first, uh, or actually before uh, profit optimiz optimization. However, I do know being a B Corp for four years now, there are still so many challenges ahead of us. Uh, there's a long road to go and we do know that the clock's ticking. So we also have to think of the situation, what if we don't succeed? What if we don't succeed in escaping from normal? And I've, I've taken your warning seriously and I've even taken a lot of notes. But what if we don't, we don't manage to escape from normal? What if we then look at normal and see the capitalism and, and, and that we see within the capitalism structure also the largest buying power um, in the coming five to, to eight or ten years from now, let, let's stick to the five or eight years because it's more optimistic will be millennials. And millennials might have a different mindset, might have different expectations, might all be more mission oriented. And once we or they have the biggest buying power, what would you see happening or changing? Hmm. Great question. I mean, um, you know, one of the problems I think with the B Corp movement, not with the B Corp companies, which are fantastic, we need just, more of them. Just a quick, quick question uh, oh. uh, in between. What does B Corp mean? Oh, well, ask him. <laughs> what does B Corp mean? <laughs> yeah, so in the United States, it's a legal entity. And, 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 but what it does mean, instead of optimizing profit for shareholders, you do optimize impact for stakeholders. It doesn't mean that you cannot make profit. It only means it does not come first, it comes second. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. And then to the reaction. Yeah, I mean, how can I say? So first of all, there's B Corps and B Corps, right? So already, you know, Blank Fiend, the head of BlackRock, two years ago wrote a letter to all his companies that BlackRock invests in. This is one of the biggest investment uh, companies in the world saying, oh, we screwed up. We need to be more purpose driven, more stakeholder driven, invest more in communities and workers. In the long run, we've lost our way. Nothing happened. It, if you look at all the metrics that I look at, things didn't change. Similarly, in August, there was this famous letter by the Business Roundtable. These are the big companies, not the smaller companies, saying that, again, we need to be more purposeful. And they said the same thing, basically, that the BlackRock Black Rock guy said uh, uh, the year before. Not much changed, <laughs> um, which doesn't mean there isn't change. It just means it's just too much talk. And personally, and, and then sorry, there's also the smaller B Corps. You know, these are companies that are not the big kind of global corporations. I don't know exactly, you know, the company that, that you're in, but many of these are kind of smaller and medium companies really driven by, as you say, more kind of millennial oriented goals around sustainability. But until that drive is not at the center of the relationship between the different economic actors, it's not gonna change. So the big change is gonna happen. When, when I mentioned the conditionalities, it's not just a stick. It's not just to say, you don't get bailed out if you don't, you know. It's about what does it mean to admit that markets, so let's just focus on capitalism, forget any other system. Capitalism has markets. It's not the state or the market. The market is an outcome of how business, which is not the market, the state through all its entities, the third sector, which in some sectors like energy and health is very important. These are kind of the more nonprofits like the Wellcome Trust, the Gates Foundation, how they're governed, but especially how they relate one to another. 
If you look at how the Gates Foundation today, by the way, is working around the vaccine production and not really supporting the World Health Organization's call for a common patent pool, I would argue that's problematic. But without going into the details, the point is that these relationships between economic actors itself has to be more purposeful. And I sometimes get bored by the B Corps talk and the conferences and or the big Davos discussions about the same concept, which is you know, more purposeful capitalism, because it's like it's not stepping outside of the box and saying, what does it look like to bring that literally at the contracts? Everything is a contract. Private property is a contract. You know, the eight hour workday is a contract. Procurement contracts are a contract. Marriage is a contract. If we don't get serious about rewriting the contracts, then what you get is what we're seeing in outer space. So Elon Musk is currently filling outer space with garbage, garbage. Like the astronauts are saying, we can't fucking see anything, <laughs> right? So all this like playground that's being created in space with space tourism or random rockets going up, um, without it being driven by a new kind of public private interaction of how are we gonna work in space together, the risk is literally what happens. It's full of rubbish. And the astronauts say, we, you know, there's too many satellites up here we just can't see. And that's a perfect example because when I talk about mission orientation, as, as I mentioned, the moonshot is the old example. And I, I talk about climate as the new big kind of moonshot. But if along the way we have bogus ways to interrelate as society, then you can get as much B core and as much purpose as you want within an organization. If it doesn't go to how they work together, it, it's not right. going to be pivotal. Thank you so much. The next question over here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Matsukato. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, isn't there, my name is Helen Mies, and I was wondering, isn't there a trade-off between conditionality and um, uh, timely, uh, the timeliness of the uh, support. Uh, you know, we were at really the lockdown. It's like we are, the economy was in a cardiac arrest. If we hadn't had uh, financial support uh, to the companies, uh, if the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank had provided financial support by March 23, we would not only have had a financial uh, a health crisis and an economic crisis, but also a financial crisis and probably also a crisis in the eurozone. How do you? What's the trade-off between conditionality and timeliness of the support that you need in times like these? Uh, it's a fantastic question. In fact, I'm, I'm again working with different governments right now on the COVID <coughs> task forces, and that's exactly the question that's asked, which is, okay, sounds great, but come on, you know, that's philosophy. We, we need action now. And I think it's just mistaken because any action today is still written up. The furlough scheme that we have in the UK, which is paying workers basically for staying home, which many countries have brought in place because it was safer and in some ways in the long run less costly to the system to just pay people not to go to work but still to have income to live on. That required writing up. It's, it's like nothing happens overnight. It's still thought about. So when Macron said we're not there just to give out money but to transform, it didn't mean the companies didn't get money right away. It just meant that the contract, which anyway exists, you don't just get money coming, you have to fill out forms, included a commitment towards reducing carbon emissions for the car industry and the airline industry, those examples I gave. It didn't mean that Air France and Renault had to reduce their emissions on the day <laughs> that they received the help, but they signed a contract. And if you're not willing to do it, like EasyJet, EasyJet said, no, just give us the money, shut up, come on, help us, we need money. I personally think they should have been told, forget it, go away, go back to the end of the queue, change your mind. Not that we don't want to help you today, but at least sign something that says you care <laughs> and you don't just see the state as a handout machine. And if that's what you think, think again. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think we have two more uh, questions, so I'm going quickly to the next one. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Michiel. Uh, I'm particularly interested in sort of fixing democracy and, and the systems that we have to sort of uh, get get to terms and, and get a grip on our reality. Uh, that's why I was very happy to hear you talk about the Citizens' Assembly just now. Mm. Um, you, 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 you're talking quite, a, or you're saying um, that 
or you seem to value risk taking and a very dynamic um, culture. You talk about growth. But on the other hand, I see that in contrast kind of with, with what I think we need. In the sense that um, I think that as humanity, we've grown, grown so powerful in our ability to create and destroy, but we don't seem to really have a good handle on that power. And I think we need more of, um, of a slower, um, slower attitude. So f not mo move fast and break stuff and not um, just do it, but rather think before you act, yeah? because the power we have is too great to just, uh, um, to just let go. Um, so how do you, how do you um, what do you think about that contrast, talking about growth, dynamic uh, risk taking, while at the th same time I think as, a, as humanity we need more sl uh, uh, slow, uh, yeah, more patience, more maturity, uh, more humility perhaps, and more, um, yeah, that. I agree with you not only a lot, but I just wrote everything you said because I need to make sure that when I speak I say it the right way because if... If, if I'm coming across, or not just me, if you know, the people that I work with come across as saying more risk taking, yeah, you know, just for the sake of it, that's the problem. <laughs> you know, risk for the sake of risk, growth for the sake of growth is a problem. So let me just back up. When I say risk taking, it's, it really means experimentation. You know, what works, what doesn't. You have to be willing to try. Um, there, there's a great, great quote, actually, by um, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who said, come on, just at least try. And he was talking about in the New Deal. And that meant, you know, even bringing the arts, as he did, he brought the designer and the arts community into the New Deal. It wasn't just cement and bricks or what we call in the UK shovel-ready projects. It's a terrible term, as though the best the government can do is fill the system with cement and bricks and, you know, shovel, <laughs> dig a hole and fill it up again. Um, and so experimenting with building better housing, better uh, energy platforms, but new ownership models, new uh, models of citizen engagement like citizen assemblies, that is risk taking because it's not linear. What I mean by risk taking is experiment, be willing to try and you might screw up along the way, but if you're so scared of failing which often, unfortunately, the state is because it gets blamed as soon as it makes one little mistake, whereas all the innovation we know has occurred over time, whether it's by public or private or anyone, has required experimentation, then the state will not be able to renew itself. And I often talk about renewing itself from within. And the other thing is patience. You know, the reason you need patient finance, which I talked about, is so that you have time to learn. One of the biggest problems we saw with inpatient finance, quick finance, right, uh, exit-driven finance in, for example, the biotechnology sector, I did most of my research on long periods of time in sectors, is you end up with lots of plepos, productless IPOs, right? So in order to issue the initial public offering, the IPO, you need to rush because the finance is like breathing down your neck and you do it so quickly, you produce nothing. So the biotech sector has failed massively in terms of its potential that we thought it had, not because it, by definition it was bad, but it was rushed. But so I agree also... with you, we need more patience, but also more empathy. Sorry, just quickly, yeah. I, I think you said the word empathy. Um, I often say that one of the first things we need to learn in the civil service, because I believe in a new curriculum, it's not just policy, we need new thinking. Like Che Guevara used to say, the new man, the new woman. We need to listen, just shut up and listen, you know, instead of patting the students on the head when they do Fridays for the Future or the green movement or the labor movement, you know, tick the box, listen. And that, you know, that's an art. My husband is a filmmaker. He used to make documentaries. He used to bring a, a, an anthropologist to work with the documentary makers who wrote a book called The Art of Listening. It's, you know, some of us maybe are born as good listeners. Most are not. And if government is going to interact in a non-tokenistic way with all the different stakeholders in defining a green transition, the first thing is to listen. And my experience with the European Commission is everything we wrote, and I you know, actually drafted most of the you know, background material which led to this missions instrument, most of that ended up being quite clear and easy. The hardest thing, which no one has achieved, is real citizen engagement. And that's because they don't know how to do it. They haven't been trained. 
Um, so instead of giving up and saying, oh, that's because it's just a bureaucracy, let's bring it to the table in the training of the civil service, Empathy 101. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the interesting evening. I have a quick question with regard to public-private uh, partnerships. I think your book gained quite some uh, traction, the entrepreneurial state, also some policy paper afterwards. I, would, I was wondering if you, uh, how you see the progress within the European institutions, since you don't want to talk about countries. Let's talk about <laughs> institutions. Yeah. So, um, first of all, it's not that I don't want to talk about countries. I work across many countries. It's just that I can't give a, a report card, A, B, C, D, on the whole country. I look at organizations within the countries. So ha having said that, there's many countries that have massively failed <laughs> in terms of basic things for their citizens, you know, much higher inequality rates, much lower business investment, state capacity being quite uh, weak, as I mentioned before. Um, I think the biggest problem in Europe, let me, let's just focus on Europe for a minute, is that even though the entrepreneurial state caught on as like a trendy idea, it sounded good, really thinking through what that meant for investments within public institutions in the ways I was talking about, um, and being much more ambitious on the portfolio of policies so we don't just say, oh, yeah, we need more innovation. We need the state to fund great things on green. And then you resort back to these indirect incentives, like the patent box, like the R&D tax credits, like different tax incentives, thinking that that's going to help. Um, that assumes that business wants to invest. And so I think the big change that has to happen on the policy design is to realize most businesses are actually perfectly happy with the status quo. They're not driven by, oh, let's change everything. Let's innovate towards you know, more sustainable growth or more inclusive this, inclusive that. They're happy, like many people are, you know, happy with more or less what's happening. If you want to drive change, and I don't mean change as the previous question asked, change for the sake of change. I mean transformational change. I mean change that gets us the sustainable development goals. Um, you, need, um, you, you need to have to really think through why you haven't done it before. Because if you think about it, people have been talking the talk of inclusive, sustainable, smart, mm growth for a long time. The European Commission has talked that talk for since the Lisbon agenda. Nothing changed. So why has it not changed? I believe in the end, the tools that they thought they had, the portfolio of the different tools they thought they had, didn't actually change. And again, I mentioned in, in the Netherlands, in Ireland, and even Canada, mm -hmm. I've looked at the portfolio of different tools they've been using, and it's been very much driven by this notion that the business sector just has to be released from the impediments of what's holding mm -hmm. it back. And so different types of incentives and not enough of what, funnily, Warren Buffett says. So Warren Buffett, as you might know, is the billionaire, one of the richest people alive. He often says to the government, he says, can you please stop reducing my capital gains tax? <laughs> He's like, I don't even look at it. I look when I see an opportunity. Um, and so I think what the policymaker should ask, and this is my last statement, because I, I actually have to go. I've got four children waiting upstairs. Um, what he says is, I invest when I see an opportunity. So the real game-changing thing would be if member states, countries, but also Europe said, what do we need to do to ch change the perception in the business sector of where the opportunities lie? So of course the state has to invest for its own sake, but unless they do it in an ambitious way, they won't change the perceptions, the expectations of whether a whole new kind of paradigm exists. And doing it through tax incentives is foolish. All it does is increase profits. Mm -hmm. And currently profits are at a global high. The profit share of GDP is at highest it's ever been. The labor share is the lowest it's ever been. That's not because of deterministic forces. It's because of really stupid policy, even by countries that believed the, the first page of the entrepreneurial state. Thank you so much. We are having one last question, Mariana. I hope you have time for one uh, a yeah. brief question and hopefully a brief response as well. <laughs> yeah, I know it's my fault. I keep giving these long answers. 
Thank you very much for, for your presentation, Professor Mazzucato. My name is Henk Overbeek. I'd, I'd like to raise a question about your understanding of capitalism. Uh, I came Sounds across. like a large, not like a brief <laughs> question. To I'll, be try, I'll try. I'll, I'll, I'll try. try to make it brief. I <laughs> let me put it. Let me make it very brief. I came across another title, not the title of today's story, but another title of yours, which said uh, how to do capitalism differently. I thought when I read it the first time I saw it, I thought how to do away with capitalism. I thought you All were right. going to raise that question. Um, because I'm, 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 I'm reminded of this by your excellent introduction where you state all these problems that we are confronting, that capitalism has created for us, financialization, inequality, uh, a rigid regime of property rights, um, a, less, a, a lack of, of uh, investment in, in research and innovation. But this all these are all fundamental, the fundamental rights of the sovereignty of capital. How are we going to deal with these fundamental and, and deeply constitutionalized rights of private capital? It's, it's, capitalism is a system of class rule. It's not a, yeah. it's not. Yes, a, thank a, you. A <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic question. And, and I'm glad you asked it because otherwise, you know, it would have been hanging there anyway. <laughs> We're all thinking it probably. So, I mean, first of all, unfortunately, I'm super practical, <laughs> which is, you know, literally London, there's so much, you know, I, I moved here 20 years ago. The level of suffering in London, the, le the number of homeless people in London, the knife crime Teenagers in my neighborhood in Camden, every weekend there's a stabbing. That's not because, oh, teenagers stab each other. It's due to massive structural uh, forces and decisions that have been taken. Let's just call it austerity, okay? There's nothing inevitable in that. That didn't have to happen. So a lot of what I think, what drives my work is that there's agency in the system. You know, the perfect system, is it capitalism? Is it socialism? Is it something in between? I, unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about it here, but I will say there's varieties of capitalism, but there's also varieties of modes of production. There's capitalism and other systems. And within capitalism, there's many different modes. Within socialism, as we know, there's many different types of socialism. That discussion, unfortunately, you need to have another conference I'll come back to. But just to explain why I do what I do, it, it's such a cop out to just say capitalism sucks. It's all, you know, I should, at, at this time of day, we, we start swearing, you know, it's all beep, beep, beep. <laughs> uh, let's just get rid of the whole thing. It's a cop out. It's a luxury to say that in the same way that I think it's a luxury to say no growth. It just allows then, you know, in some ways the forces to remain because we end up getting the wrong type of growth because the nitty gritty decisions of let's actually do growth differently. You know, what does green growth look like, but especially who decides that, as I said, so it's not just top down. All, all those questions around citizen assemblies, new voices at the table, don't get asked if we just say it's about no growth or no capitalism. Having said that, because when I look at change, I look I get my hands very dirty. You know, I'm working now with the World Health Organization on saying, how should we govern this damn race for the vaccine? Because what I'm seeing is a very problematic predator prey, parasitic public private partnership again and again and again in the pharmaceutical industry. You know, we need to be fighting both battles. We need to keep our eye on the prize, which is we actually need just a better system. And we need to rethink the big categories. That's why I always think of, you know, redefining the words, you know, instead of public goods, it sounds good, but it's just a correction in economics for something that the private sector is not doing, the market failure. You say, think of the common good or think of the public good as an objective, not a correction. That's like the big picture. And if that means completely organizing society differently, let's go for it. But in the meantime, bring a public good, common good, public purpose perspective to procurement, to the grants, to the loans, to the industrial strategy, to the innovation policy within this system, believe me, it has a huge effect on people's lives. People die when we structure health innovation in the wrong way. 
people, you know, die when we allow water to be poisoned, like in Flint, Michigan. So it's a luxury to say the whole system sucks and we don't fight the day-to-day -day battles. We need to do both. And I think your question is, is perfect because it's difficult to do both. If you get so you know, busy like I, I do, my nails are very dirty, you can't see them, I need a manicure. If, if you get your hands dirty and fixing the everyday, the risk is you, you, you lose sight of the bigger questions. I, I'll just say as my last statement, we need both. We need to constantly rethink the system. Is there a better system? What does it look like? And in the meantime, pay attention. Make the street, on you know, my street, I can show you, uh, <laughs> London, <laughs> make your street better. So, you know, think global, act global, but do it seriously and not just, you know, the chat. Thank you so much, uh, Mariana Matsukanto. <laughs> Thank you so much for... Um... <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, sharing your broad ideas, but also your very practical, uh, practical solutions, as well as your wonderful uh, room and the streets outside uh, London, I think. So uh, yeah. thanks. Um, just one last question. I saw a tweet of you uh, last year, which triggered me uh, very much, because you, uh, you tweeted, I'm, I'm not sure if you remember, that you were dreaming of a collaborative event on new economic thinking, uh, together with economists such as uh, Kate Rayworth, but also artists such as Olivier uh, Eliasson yeah. and Stromae. And I was so curious whether this event has happened or whether we should still organize it here in the Bali someday. So, I mean, I, I, I work with Oliver Eliasson. We're actually curating, unfortunately it's been canceled, but the Venice Biennale this year, um, the Architecture Biennale has been canceled. It's happening in a year's time. We're co-curating together the Pavilion for the United Nations, which is undergoing its 75th anniversary. Kate Rayworth, we work together. Um, Stromae, uh, I would love to. Instead, I'm working with a wonderful rapper called George the Poet. Look up Hi. his work. He's, yeah. he's, he's fascinating. He's actually going to do a PhD with me around how do we, precisely on these issues, how do we value the art that's created, for example, by hip hop and rap, so that so many young black artists aren't, in the end, even perceived as value creators only one out of you know, 10,000 to make any money from mm -hmm. it. And many of them end up back in the criminal justice system. But especially once the value is created, what are the new contracts to make sure that value is reinvested back into communities, social housing, um, youth centers, arts facilities for the community. Most of the money from hip hop and rap, it's, it's huge. It's a billion dollar industry, it gets extracted out. It doesn't go back. Thanks. To yeah. the sources. So that's how I'm interacting with the, the rap. Thanks. Community. Thank you so much. <laughs> but yeah, I would like to thank you, you Mariana, <laughs> but also the audience here and the people who are watching online. I'm wishing you all a very uh, good evening. <laughs>